group, please to welcome Dr. Uh, Sarah Hippensteel Paul. Hope we got all those right. And she's a uh, manager of the Waste Watershed Part uh, Partnerships of the Miami Conservancy District. And she's going to talk about an overview of the history and the roles, operation, and direction of the Miami Conservancy District. Let's welcome Sarah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am going to talk about the agency. I'm going to talk about the flood. I'm going to talk about water. I'll talk about East Palestine. Um, you know, and then it's a nice small crowd, so you're going to ask me questions anytime you want. Just raise your hand um, so that, you know, we've, we've got, I've got a, about 45 minutes, right, of yeah, this. At least. Yep. And so anytime you have a comment or a question, we're not going to wait to the end. We're just going to do that throughout. So I'll uh, tell you about myself in just a second, but... I do start out with a little video, if we get it to work. Life. Since we are made up of 60% water, our bodies need it to survive. Every day we use water in countless ways, from taking a hot shower, to pouring our morning coffee, to brushing our teeth. Not to mention that every bite of food we eat is available thanks to water. Water is also a driving force in our economy. Large underground aquifers provide our region's drinking water and power major industries like agriculture and manufacturing. Additionally, our rivers provide opportunities for recreation, including fishing, paddling, and rowing. Riverfront cities understand the power of water and are developing places to live, shop, eat, and play. These developments are creating employment opportunities as today's job seekers are looking for fun and active experiences and new attractions, events, and entertainment draw more tourists, benefiting our economy. Since water is such a crucial part of our lives, it's important that we have a safe and plentiful supply. MCD monitors the region's water and works to protect it, allowing the Miami Valley to be more resilient and thrive. MCD, be water wise. So the Conservancy District is a regional government agency. I'll specifically talk about what we do and how we were formed, but I can't really talk about today until I start talking about what happened um, you know, well over 100 years ago. So it was Easter weekend. Three major storms converged over the Midwest. The ground was frozen and it began to rain. And over three days in this region, and actually through parts of Canada and Indianapolis and Columbus and all sorts of, you know, a big part of the Midwest, um, enough rain came through this region in three days to equal two weeks over Niagara Falls. Enough water came through this region. And the ground was frozen, so it had no place to go. And in our region, we are sitting on a giant bowl of gravel. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, the glaciers came through. When they did, they scraped out a giant cavern, and that is filled up with gravel. And then there's a thin layer of soil on top. So normally, if a large storm comes to our region, I guess we're about to get one any second, uh, that aquifer helps us out by holding that water. But when the ground is frozen, it could not get into our aquifer. So all of the water from these three major storms was treated as runoff through, you know, over our land and into our river channels. So the river began to rise, and unfortunately, the height of the flood was at night. And so there was no uh, real no ability to warn people that it was coming. It, they were caught by surprise. And uh, several weeks before, there had been a major windstorm and had knocked down all of the uh, telegraph or many of the telegraph wires and those had not been put back up in place so they really were left with no way to warn people that it was coming. The good news is <clears throat> that most people were rescued, only a few hundred people died, uh, so that was a success story and there are many many flood stories which I won't talk about tonight but you know you can get a rich history if you go to Carillon you can go get immersed in the flood uh, history by walking into their exhibit where they you know you can hear the barking dogs and the fire alarms going off and you know it's a real 
interactive exhibit to get more of a taste of that. But I will just say that NCR uh, jumped into action. Patterson at the time began to build boats. They opened their cafeteria to people. The University of Dayton housed people uh, who lost their homes. And so really it was a success story that only a few hundred people died. If you think about back then, our major tr mode of transportation, thousands of horses died. So it really uh, devastated the region, ground us to a halt, and of course we're standing in the, you know, really in the, maybe we're up kind of high on a hill here, but uh, we're really standing in the, you know, the major part of what would have um, been underwater. My office is in downtown Dayton across from Riverskate next to the Engineers Club, if you know where that is, and uh, our building would have been 20 feet underwater. So to give you some taste of how it would have been. I love these, these are two of my favorite, there, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of photos from the flood. But this one is one of my favorites. This is how desperate people were. And when we think back to the big storm that hit Katrina, Louisiana a few years ago when people were breaking out into the attics, they were uh, you know, trying to get rescued at the time, that, that is what was happening here. People were having to, they went to the second floor and then they went to their attic and then eventually had to break out and were on their rooftops waiting to be rescued. These are not power lines. It, these would have been telegraph lines, so it's not actually as dramatic as it looks, but it's still very dramatic, right, that they were, they were traversing these lines to try to be rescued. Uh, another little tidbit, interesting story is that because of all the gas that was coming, the gas lines that were coming into people's homes and businesses, uh, those caught on fire. And so there are these harrowing stories of people that would have crossed these wires to get to another building next door or somehow getting rooftop to rooftop, escaping not only staying away from the floodwaters, but escaping the fire that was crawling towards them um, it, you know, in parts of the region. So real, real harrowing, desperation, uh, a real surprise to people, and um, this is this is a uh, part of the Patterson legacy with the NCR boat building, and they were rescuing people. If you take a closer look at some of the photos that um, we have available, the interesting thing is that they were all they're all wearing like these very formal outfits. And you know, was it Easter Sunday? Did they dress like that all the time? But there were pictures of people on their rooftops in these very like, austere. Out, you know, long dresses and coats and things, I don't know, waiting for the boat to come by. I don't know, I guess that's the way. Everyone dressed back then, but <clears throat> lots of interesting photos. In today's damage, it would be, I need to change that, it's more like five billion, I'm sorry. I need to change that with inflation. Um, so today's damages would be about five billion dollars. So the slogan for the fundraising to solve this, the impact so that they never had to go through it again, was remember the promises that you made in the attic. And so that this is the Montgomery County Courthouse downtown. One of these flags was in our possession for many years. We donated it to the Carillon exhibit just a few years ago, so you can go see one of these flags. Presumably, one of the flags that was hanging is now at Carillon, although it didn't come with, it. when we pulled it out of our archives, it didn't come with a note. So, you know, we, we think it's one of these flags. Um, but they literally raised the money, 50 cents a dollar. Everybody gave what they had to solve this problem locally. And that's one of the long legacies of the solution for flood protection in this region is that it is not state or federal controlled or owned. We locally built this, we locally fund it today, and we locally control it for our region. Excuse me. Yes, go that, right ahead. That, that is still a fairly unique way of, of protecting people if it's privately funded, correct? I mean, there's not many that mostly go federal state many many flood protection systems are built or managed or owned by the, the army corps of engineers right. um I, I can't say that there aren't other local protection systems because you know there are quite a few but they're certainly not not as common even other conservancy districts in the state of ohio and not every place has a conservancy district it's only if the communities wanted to form that regional government which i'll tell you about in a second um, even the other conservancy districts are involved with the core. There, some are local, but uh, some of the larger ones are. So you are separate from the core of engineers then, or are you involved? The Army Corps of Engineers, we do have to follow some of their federal regulations and policies, but yes, they, they have nothing to do with the management or funding of our project, unless we somehow tap into one of their grant funds or something like that. 
but yeah. And Muskingum Conservancy on the other side of the state, for example, those dams and levees that they have are managed and owned by the Corps. So, okay. So the citizens said, we never want this to happen again. Remember those promises you made in the attic. And they hired a young engineer named Arthur Morgan, who you may be familiar with his name. He, uh, was, uh, he was actually f not formally trained. He didn't have a degree in engineering at the time he was um, hired, or he hadn't finished his degree. But his family had an engineering firm, and so he had a lot of experience. And he was quite a systems thinker. So someone in our region had heard about him and uh, brought him, hired him to uh, solve our problem at a systems basis. Now, part of that is because this wasn't our first flood. It was certainly our largest, and it's still the largest flood that this region has ever seen, or really Ohio's largest natural disaster to date. Um, but he, um, he, he was hired, uh, what was I gonna say? Sorry, I do. I was on a roll there. I was going to say something about Arthur Morgan. Um, and he, he came and looked at this as a system space. Oh, so it certainly wasn't our first flood. So we had been building and rebuilding the levees in these riverfront towns higher and higher and higher. And there had been dozens of floods in the last the 50 years prior to 1913. In fact, the equipment was sitting in the channel to rebuild after the last big flood that had gone through. And so their solution at the time was just keep building these levees higher. Arthur Morgan came in and said, no, 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 we need to look at water at its source. And so the Conservancy District itself was created on the boundaries of the watershed. So the watershed is the land area that all drains to the Great Miami River. So that's all or parts of 15 counties in southwest Ohio. So instead of just dealing with flood protection on the levee, at the levee, we are holding back, we're storing floodwaters way up in the headwaters so that the levees complement what the dams are doing, but the dams are doing the heavy lifting. And I'll show you where those are in a second. So some of the other interesting things about the history of this uh, agency is that it was the largest public works project of its kind. It was all built completely in seven years by hand, no OSHA, uh, only steam engines, only two people, two fatalities during the whole process. They built cities at each dam site to bring in enough workers. And Arthur Morgan was also as much of a social scientist as he was a physical engineer. And he did not want the little towns that he was building to be um, of ill repute while these brought these you know male workers in. So he built cities, schools, churches, um, dormitories for the single men. He brought had them all bring their families, so that it was it really was an intentional community. And later on, he went on to build intentional communities all around the world. They are still some of them in existence. Um, so his legacy was really much more than just deciding where water should or shouldn't go. And some of those towns are, you know, uh, the dams are Englewood, Taylorsville. If you go to the Englewood Dam and you kind of drive around down, um, you can get to some, there's a little neighborhood there. If you know where to look carefully, uh, there are some of those original homes. His wife actually designed the homes. Uh, and, and the buildings, and so if you know where to look, uh, you can spot some of the original homes. Uh, Germantown, uh, the little city that was there, was completely um, dismantled. People bought the homes and carted them off, and so if you know where to look in parts of Dayton, uh, you can, someone can point out where these homes have been moved to and are still little, you know, residences. Um, highway was moved in two cases. Uh, the Route 40 was moved in two cases. So it was a big, huge project. So imagine that it was all done in seven years by hand. The, um, the entire town of Osborne was relocated, and of course, and, and Fairfield, and that became Fairborn. Uh, so it was just incredible to think of it today, pulling something off like that in only seven years. We can't even get any curbs and gutters in our neighborhood in seven years, right? You can't get the permits in that time. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. All local donations, locally funded. 
So here's where I skip ahead 100 years and tell you about the Conservancy District. So I uh, know that people love hearing about the flood, and I could go on and on and really spend hours and hours doing nothing but that. But I want to tell you what we're doing today, because that tragedy and that amazing systems-based solution um, got us here today and is keeping our city safe from flooding. It's making sure now our groundwater and our surface water are clean and healthy and plentiful for us. And it's also uh, programming these places so that we have something active, exciting, and fun to do to improve our quality of life. Because nobody wants to live next to a polluted river or even live to it next to a river that doesn't have anything to do on it. So I'm going to talk about all those things. So we're going to leave 1913 behind. We just celebrated the... Uh, so the, the Conservancy was created in 1915, so we celebrated the 100th then, we commemorated the flood, then we celebrated the anniversary of the Conservancy District, and then, <laughs> there's a distinction, and then, and then um, this last year was 100 years of those dams. And so now we're thinking very seriously about what is going to happen the next 100 years, and how do we keep these dams um, healthy and, and strong and doing their job um, for the future. So the dams themselves have held back water over 2,000 times, or I should say the system has held stored water. Uh, it might not have been all five dams at once, it might not have been all the levee systems at once, but at some point we were storing water over 2,000 times since 1922. So that's 2,000 times that that river didn't jump its banks. I came to the Conservancy District, uh, well, it's been a while. If I tell you how long, you're going to be like, wow, she's a lot older than she looks. Um, I came to the Miami Valley in 1999, I think, and I started working with the Conservancy District in 2002, the very end, December of 2002. I was hired to help communities think about water um, quality and my background and all my degrees are in helping communities get activated around water issues and solving some of those water challenges. And I'll talk about some of those things that uh, we're still worried about that would prevent our water from being clean in the future and how community members can get activated. I have an undergraduate degree from The Ohio State University from the School of Natural Resources in Watershed Policy and Planning. I was like made to be here. And my master's degree is from Antioch, Seattle, Washington in environment and community, where I actually studied something called the public trust doctrine, which uh, holds, holds water in trust for the good of all of us um, for the future. It's actually something that Ohio law still follows, the public trust doctrine. And um, I have a PhD in leadership and organizational behavior from Antioch, which is a combination of all their campuses. I've spent time in Keene, New Hampshire, and Santa Barbara, California. And my uh, thesis, my dissertation was actually on the effectiveness of community-based watershed organizations to impact water issues. So it's just about water. I live in Urbana. I've lived there for 22, when I was in my 20s, I thought it was a good idea to buy a farm. And <laughs> <laughs> I still, I live in one of the five oldest houses in Champaign County on Chapman's Creek, which runs to the Mad River. Chapman's is named after Johnny Chapman. You've heard of him? It's Johnny Appleseed. And I don't know if he was there or not, but that's the creek's name. And um, our house was 200 years old this year. So we raise maple syrup. My husband raises rainbow trout. He's retired, so that keeps him busy. And uh, I drive to Dayton every day. So, or most days. Yes. So that's the agency's mission. Now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about each mission area. So I've kind of already covered flood protection and what we do and how we do it. These are some of the statistics on what we cover. So this isn't just about preventing water from jumping the banks in the rivers and making sure that your, your basement doesn't get wet, although there's groundwater flooding and that's a whole other issue. But we're making sure that your homes are safe, but it's also making sure that if you call 911, those bridges don't have, you know, the, the, the emergency vehicles can still get on the roads and making sure that business is unnecessary or kids can get to school. So you don't think at all about flood protection because it doesn't flood here because the system is doing its job so effectively. 
So it's not just about preventing flooding along the rivers. It's about preventing any, you know, break in activity during these, you know, the times that we're needing to. I would say that we haven't scratched the surface on, uh, that's a euphemism, on, on the, the ability for this system to protect a lot of water. Our system is designed to protect 40% more than the Great Flood of 1913, which was the largest flood that we've ever seen. I used to think in the beginning when I was doing this that it felt a little bit like we were over-engineered, that I would tell you, ooh, you know, your money is going to this system that we're never going to need. And then Katrina hit Louisiana, and climate change began to affect our rainfall amounts, and so we are going to need that capacity. Uh, we haven't even come to, we, we had a big one in 56, we had a big one in 12, more recently, um, but still a small percentage of the system, and we don't know what we're going to need in the future, and, but it's going to be there for us, so thank goodness. Because you can pick up the newspaper, I always challenge, my, when I talk to students, I don't tell them about the newspaper because they don't know what that is, pick up their, you know, read the news, pick up a magazine, a newspaper any day, I dare you to find a publication that doesn't have some article about water in it, right? So water is one of our critical um, <coughs> issues, and flooding certainly is impacting other parts of the country, but it's not going to impact us here. Uh, <clears throat> these little blue blobs, those are not lakes. That's the area of land that we protect from any development so that we can store floodwaters in it. Those are our basins. And we allow farming, we allow private ownership, uh, we love some other activities, but nobody can live there. We don't have, want to have to rescue anyone. And so those are really the bathtubs behind the, the dam. The dams have no moving parts. They, they work like a bathtub. They have an open conduit, a hole. And when the rivers begin to, begin to rise, then only so much is allowed to go through that, and the rest starts to store in these areas behind each dam. You probably pass Huffman frequently. You might pass Englewood or Taylorsville if you're up there. Uh, you may never ever, unless you go out of the way to do it, go past Germantown Dam. It's on the Twin Creek. Uh, certainly, I would, has anyone been to Lockington? Uh, okay, all right. Because uh, it is really out of the way on a small country road. Um, and it stores water on the Loramie Creek. So Loramie Creek, Twin Creek, Mad River, and then uh, Great Miami and the Stillwater. So that's where we're storing floodwaters. And then we do have a series of levees, that's these or little orange blobs, um, that are doing uh, local protect. we call it local protection. We also have quite a bit of um, preserved floodplain. So the river knows how to store floodwaters. If we would just back off the corridors, it the floodplains, um, you know, are, are almost like the kidneys of the, the river. That's where the water comes up and is stored and then back down. And it also is a very good filtration system for any um, contaminants that might be coming down the river or even just soil particles. But we do also own um, and preserve quite a bit of just natural river corridor. And because of that and the way the system works, uh, this river is one of the healthiest rivers in the state. We were told it made the second best comeback when the Clean Water Act was passed, second only to the, the Scioto. And part of that is because we have preserved so many miles of river corridor. Behind each dam, so in a normal dam situation, it holds water all the time, you know, like a lake, a damned lake. That water is actually not nearly as healthy and doesn't support as much wildlife as a free-flowing river. So because our rivers are always running unimpeded, at least some, uh, our rivers are just much, much, much healthier. And uh, smallmouth, how many people are fish or anglers? Number one sport in the world. More people fish than any other sport in the world. And uh, we, cer we certainly have a better population of smallmouth bass here than anywhere. And we've done some statistics on that. One of our uh, engineers is also a, a rabid angler. And so he's dove deep into the fishing data that DNR collects. And we believe that we have a bigger and better population of larger smallmouth than any place else in the state. OK, blah, blah, blah. I have a lot to go. 
So just to say that Arthur Morgan didn't just think about flood protection, he was also focusing on how do we make better quality of life for these communities. And so from the beginning, he was encouraging recreation at our facilities and encouraging us to think about um, other water stewardship issues, which I'll get into. So his idea, you know, one of the ones that we don't uh, encourage anymore, or maybe we never did, was that he thought diving off parts of the sides of the dam into the river would be a good recreation. No, 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 we think that's a terrible idea. Um, but we have been building bike trails for uh, over 50 years now along our levee tops and inside the levees, nice and flat, already preserved, you know, already public spaces. And so we built our first 10 miles of bike trail in the 70s, and now we um, manage over 30 miles, but it's connected to over 300 miles that this region has helped build. It's, I'm skipping ahead, but we have been thinking about these, you know, the way that this is, um, these three legs of the sustainability stool or community stool have interacted since our very beginning. And that's because he was such a forward thinker. And I should say, just a little history, he went on to be the, um, chief engineer for, he built the dams of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, he was fired famously by Roosevelt because they had a falling out over the production of those dams for electricity. He felt that uh, those, the electricity that was created by those dams should be given free or very low cost to the people who gave up their land. And they had a falling out and Rose, Roosevelt and Lilienthal at the time won and uh, and Arthur Morgan quit or was fired and came back to the Miami Valley to then change to Antioch College and created the co-op system that they're so famous for. And he lived in the Yellow Springs until he was in his 90s and into, I think, the early 80s, 1980s. And so uh, anyway, he did lots of other famous things than just build the Conservancy District. So let's just talk about water. So aside from the fact that we don't want it in our homes or in our businesses or on our streets, we really can't live without it. And so we can go, you know, days without food or days without, um, weeks without, days without, weeks without food, but only three days without water. Yeah. No, I've said it so many times, you know. <laughs> um, so not only do we need it for drinking, but we need it for every aspect of your life. So think about all the things that you do with water on a daily basis. You get up in the morning, you make your coffee. I barely get my little eyeballs open without my, my, my K cup there, two K cups some days. And so, you know, we wash our hands, um, clean ourselves, make our food, uh, water our pets bowl. I have horses, so I've got to have water for the horses. Um, you know, everything from the clothes we put on take a tremendous amount of water during production. The drugs that we take uh, take a tremendous amount of water during production, food, all of those things. And there's not really one aspect of your life that you can't tie directly back to a critical need for water. So we're going to have to have it, and we're going to have to have a lot of it, and very clean. I would say that this, uh, in other parts of the country, they pull their drinking water from reservoirs or rivers, so surface water. We have the added benefit of having that bowl of gravel underneath us, which is an excellent natural filtration system, and then it's filled up with water. And so when our uh, communities pull their drinking water from the ground, it's really almost drinking water quality at that point. Most of our communities treat for aesthetics, so hardness, uh, taste. Uh, but a lot of drinking water purveyors in this region, public water systems, they don't have to do a whole lot of treatment. Now, I will tell you that the more human impact that we have on the land that runs into these water systems, the more we will need to be paying for added treatment for things like PFAS and vinyl chloride, I don't know, whatever's coming off East Palestine, which I'll talk about that in a second. But the more pristine that we can keep our land around our wells and in our source water areas, the less treatment that we're going to have, um, which will keep all of our costs down. So Amelin is a drug company in this region. They use a ton of water. They came here because they knew they could access water. Cargill, do you know what that is? Corn. You can smell the corn syrup from corn. here probably. I thought I could smell it a few miles ago. Um, 
it, they have their largest corn processing plant in the U.S. in this watershed, and they have their largest soybean processing plant, ones in Sydney, and then of course ones on the Monroe. And they 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 came here because they need that water for for processing, um, <clears throat> and the close proximity to. Um, um, coin and soybean producers. I could go back to that map and show you that more than 70% of our land use is in corn and soybean production. So farming is our number one economic engine and, and of course Cargill is here for that. Anyway, Miller Coors, you know, we're getting kind of close, right? We're almost there. They produce more than 60 kinds of beer for all sorts of different companies. It's actually owned by Molson now, but they kept this brand name for in, at this location because they thought it would play better, um, and they use a tremendous amount of water from the aquifer, and they came here knowing that they could produce high quality product, still have a good um, you know, bottom line, and um, because, because of the water in our aquifer. Number one economic engine in the state, uh, nobody wants to fish next to a polluted, in a polluted river, and um, you know, we used to turn our backs to these rivers. We were terrified. The Great Flood of 1913 scarred this region, not only uh, to rebuild, but also just our mindset of that river is scary and we shouldn't be near it. So for many years, we lined our industry up next to it. We put our bus depots on Prime River, front, what now would become be considered Prime River front property, um, you know, things that, that weren't that great. That's changing, and of course, Miamisburg is a shining example of how they have taken back their riverfront and had that uh, developed it as an asset to the, the community and, and the people that live in it. So we're seeing that clean rivers um, just are everything to the, the health of this region and the health of the economic economy. Okay, any questions about flood protection? Because I have gone on and on about that, and I'm moving to something different. So we work to preserve quality and quantity. We've been doing water quality monitoring since before the EPA was even created in the 50s. We began to look at the problems that the river was having. Back in the 50s, what was the main pollutant in the rivers? PCBs, maybe. Good guess. PDT. Nope. Sure. Untreated human sewage. Sure. So <laughs> it's not fun to think about. So we built regional wastewater treatment plants for communities at their request. So we got into the wastewater treatment plant business. Uh, we divested all those plants back to the communities that they're in. Franklin is one of them. Uh, Dayton is uh, Western Regional is one of them. And then uh, Tri-Cities, which is Vandalia, Tip, Huber. Um, so we, we were in the wastewater treatment plant for many business for many, many years. And um, so we go way back with this issue. But, well, okay, all right, I'll talk about that for a second. But we've evolved over the years from <laughs> wastewater to stormwater issues, um, to watershed planning. It really is based on what the communities are asking us to help them with. And some of that driver is what's coming out of the Clean Water Act or um, other regulations where we recognize that there's pollutants coming from a source um, then you know we're sort of evolving to help communities. So, wastewater, stormwater, um, nutrient runoff from farms is kind of one of our latest focuses. So we're we're always evolving to uh, PFAS. Of course, is evolving very quickly as one of the emerging issues. Okay, so here's here's where I tell you seventy percent of the land use is in agriculture. Everything in green is ag, and yellow is where people are living. So we're all we're living along the river corridor. Um, and in the, the headwaters where all the small streams are is, is being primarily farmed. Now underneath us is this huge source of groundwater and it's replenishable. So that's the thing, the difference between us and other aquifers in the country. In Texas, they have a big aquifer, but, they, but it doesn't rain. So that bowl never gets filled back up. Because we have just a thin layer of soil on top of this giant bowl of gravel, every time it rains, that bowl is getting replenished. So it's a very renewable resource for us, and as long as we continue to treat it well and our, our land practices um, treat them well, then we're going to continue to have a nice full bowl. Okay. <coughs> I'm afraid.
afraid if I did that, I would blow you out of the water, literally. Okay. Talk, talk, talk. Makes my mouth dry. All right. 1.5 million people live here, but 2.2 pull their drinking water from the ground. You might have seen that earlier. It's because the city of Cincinnati, which is here, actually has wells in our aquifer. So 1.4 million people here, but 2.2 benefit from the, the groundwater. Now, if you're following East Palestine, you'll know that they shut off their drinking water intake to the Ohio River in the last couple days because of the plume of the leftover contaminants that were coming down. Very minor in the grand scheme of what happened way up there. But um, they do also pull from the Ohio River. <clears throat> so East Palestine is, well, is right here, right? Yeah. The Ohio River flows along the border and then keeps going. I have gotten a number of phone calls from the press, from concerned citizens, from friends, um, from all over asking whether or not the contaminants from East Palestine are going to affect us here. The simple answer is gravity just doesn't work like that. Our river is flowing, starts at Indian Lake, flows across this land, so all the little streams are flowing into the Great Miami, which dumps down into the Ohio just west of Cincinnati. It is just physically impossible for the water to, we flow into the Ohio, the Ohio River doesn't flow into us. So any contaminants that are coming down this waterway are just going past the mouth of the Great Miami and keep on going. What about the subterranean uh, aquifers? Mm -hmm. I looked at some maps, any connection there? None. Okay. Zero. That's good. Between here and there, first of all, they're flowing the other way. Mm -hmm. Second of all, between here and there is a lot of bedrock. So our bowl is here. It's isolated. Right. Unfortunately, the Columbus Dispatch took somebody's quote out of context, took it more out of context, and freaked everyone out because they literally said the Great Miami River will be impacted from the Ohio River contaminants. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So I've been on TV. We've been other people in my office have been talking to reporters. I wrote a blog. I wrote three blogs. I put some social posts out. Okay, so on a good day, a social post from one of our channels, or anyone who talks about water in general, might get shared one, two, five shares would be like, hey, we." our post about this was shared 181 times. I mean, I wish some of our other topics would get that much play, but, you know, at least people are, because our social post said, you're, you're not going to be impacted here. Um, what about all the chemicals that burn into the yeah, which are very, very bad, also going the other way. So our weather patterns are coming west to east. So I'm not an expert air, but I have read the stuff that's coming out of those experts. It's the same thing. Pennsylvania is getting it all. I mean, it's all going west, east. It, the, the weather patterns just don't come the other direction. And the stuff in the air is, sounds terrible. Okie dokie. So here is what's regulated. Uh, anybody with a pipe that's going to the river. So wastewater treat. You flush your toilet. If you if you're paying for sewer, um, then your toilet water and your sink water are all going to the wastewater treatment plant, which is regulated. They have to treat it before they discharge it to the river. If you're on a well you're required to have a septic tank that meets certain standards, but that's up to you, right? How many people are on a septic? I am. So we're all regulated somehow. Large industries, anyone, they have to get permits, they could get fined, they have to do monitoring. All these people have to do their own monitoring. They might get double checked, EPA does inspections. There's lots of checks and balances on all of these people who declare, I'm gonna be dumping into the river 
or into a small stream, they have to follow the Clean Water Act, which was passed in 1972 and made a huge difference in our water quality all around the country. Large construction sites, um, large farms, but here's where I tell you who's not regulated. Pretty much anybody with a small farm, most residential, nobody's going to come after you if you don't pick up your dog after he does his business. Um, nobody's going to come after you if you use too much fertilizer on your lawn and it runs off the next time it rains. So any way that we're using the land that we have contaminants mixed in can end up in our curbs and gutters and those flow straight to the river untreated for the most part in this region. There are communities, plenty of them around the country, but not so much here, that their curb and gutter goes to the wastewater treatment plant along with the toilet water. Because they thought at the time, we should treat all of this before it goes out. Well, the problem is it rains a lot. And when it rains a lot, more than the capacity of that treatment plant, and here comes the toilet water, they have permits that say, oh, well, you can just bypass the whole thing now. Okay, so now you do have untreated human sewage going back into the river. During modern times, with a permit that was stamped by, you know, the agencies saying it's okay. Now, most of those are under a federal consent decree or some kind of requirement to get rid of them. The problem is every single street Every single curb and gutter, every single sewer has to be uncombined and it costs hundreds if not billions of dollars around the country and um, it's going to take some time. So for example, Cincinnati, their price tag on that was $4 billion. They were able to offset that with some newer engineering techniques. Uh, Columbus, same thing. Lot, they're doing a lot of like more uh, modern green engineering techniques so that instead of having water going down the pipe at all, they're creating small rain gardens in neighborhoods. They're collecting it in smaller dispersed places all over instead of just sending it all down through the pipe system. Anytime you have rain that can settle into a green space, it will, you know, it will the, the soil will uh, filter it out, the plants will take it up, and so we're always telling people, you know, if you can disconnect any kind of your pipes into a green area, you're always going to have a benefit to our aquifer, to your plants, to the system that would have taken it, so, yeah. So how do we rank related to others? Well, here's the bad news situation. Ohio is one of the largest dischargers of nutrients, that's mm -hmm. nitrogen and phosphorus, that comes from primarily farms. I'm not here to say farmers are doing a bad job. In fact, they don't want to lose their expensive fertilizer down the drain. However, because more than 70% of our land is in agricultural production, that's the biggest contributor that we have to non-point source pollution. So. That doesn't mean that all of us shouldn't be thinking about what we're doing on our own land, but We've been spending a lot of time and energy and designing programs and in, uh, financial incentives to get those farmers to change the way that they're applying. The timing of the application, the amount of the application, um, putting in vegetation along farm fields so that the, the extra vegetation can take up the fertilizer if it runs off. We're trying all the things so that this is not, um, so that we can get out of being one of these major contributors. So. Our little streams go to the Great Miami, which goes to the Ohio River, which goes to the Mississippi, which goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Sorry, I should have said that. What, what's the progress being made trying to implement this? Because I mean, it's a huge backlog already. And, you know, is it reducing the levels? Have you seen, has it been seen yet? Or is it still trying to get there rather than, or stabilize it rather than decreasing? Yeah, it's um, a, a challenge based on size. Uh, there is a will there. Farmers want to work with these programs, uh, but they have a you know a really tight bottom line, and so if it if it means changing their practices and investing in new equipment, they might not have the money to do that. 
Uh, it, you know, it's just a huge area. It's just a trade-off because if you use less fertilizer, you get smaller yields overall. And I mean, you can't optimize or can adapt to whether to optimize or not. Yeah, and I think we're competing with um, the companies that sell fertilizers and the, the influence they have over that narrative. Uh, so we're also spending some time working with um, organizations who think a lot about soil regeneration and how there are uh, emerging techniques and ways of thinking about farming in general, that these single monocrops uh, you know, require all of this extra herbicide and fertilizer. And so there is a movement to try to shift away from a monocrop to something that's you know, more diverse. And I'll tell you about the growing season, that's gonna end up being a challenge to them too. So anyway, the good news is this river is one of the cleanest in the state, I already said that. We monitor how high the groundwater is, the quality of it. We monitor the river levels. Of course, you know that because we care about flood protection. Um, but so we're monitoring quality and quantity of both surface and groundwaters. And we have a lot of partnerships to help us do that effectively. We work a ton with universities to do specific studies. We're out there every day collecting information. And we even teach citizen scientists to go out and collect data for us too. Because we have a small staff, EPA has a very small staff, and so we certainly can't get to all 6,600 miles of rivers and streams to really understand what's going on. So we train an army of volunteers who, are, who can be trained to be experts at collecting data as well. And then we'll have a better picture. We don't want to be surprised that something has been getting bad for a while um, just because we didn't have time to go collect data on it. So we collect all this data in a, a lot of different ways. And we've designed a, a huge portal, an online data portal, where you can go and dive in and look at some of this stuff. We also boil it down into easy um, to understand summaries and reports uh, as well. But the raw data is out there for, for some people to look at. Now, we do all of these things with our communities to help them protect that source water. And I, I talked about a little bit about some of these, but just to highlight, you know, we help preserve land where we can. So we leverage state and federal grants to buy up sensitive lands over aquifers, along rivers, so that just they're not developed in an inappropriate way. The more that you add concrete to the land, or the more that you have um, any kind of runoff over those lands, the more you could have pollutants into our rivers and aquifers. So we're trying to locate sensitive areas and just making sure they're permanently preserved. They could still be ac accessible for recreation, but you know, just not a parking lot anymore. Um, Sealing abandoned wells, we're building native prairies, you know, green infrastructure. So instead of having a hard parking lot, you have actually we can have we can have pervious asphalt, pervious concrete, pervious pavers. So you can still have your driveway, your parking lot, and park on it, but it allows rainfall to soak through. And here we've got prairies and trees in certain places. If you do have a private well, you should test it annually, and we have a whole uh, host of support for you, either just telling you where to go and do it, send it to a lab, or we have these events called Test Your Well Events, where you bring a little sample bottle in and we'll test it right on the spot. Um, bacteria, uh, arsenic, which is naturally occurring in our region, so we really should keep an eye on that. And then, um, something else, which is, nitrates, nitrates. Sewage. Sewage. Well, that's a bacteria. We don't want your septic tank actually mingling with your well. <clears throat> but this is just one water. When you look at the river during times of low flow, like let's say September when it hasn't rained a lot, you're looking at about 30% groundwater. So the groundwater, the aquifer keeps water in the river during those times, as well as ex accepting water when we need to be storing it. Mad River is about 100%. So it runs at about 56 degrees all the time. That's the same temperature as groundwater. That's why the trout are up there. And that's why the uh, fly fishermen love to go up there because the trout like it cold. So the groundwater and the surface water are completely interactive. This was news to me when I took Geology 101 at Ohio State. I was shocked by that. Okay. Um, just to give you some water, some trends in climate and, and um, and water, what are we seeing around here? Because we've been collecting data for over 100 years. So it's getting hotter. I don't think that's any news to anybody. It was eight, what, who told me it was 80 degrees in Cincinnati today? Yeah. Uh, it's February, people. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting more rain. 
This is not an annual average. This is a 30-year average. So the 30-year average has gone from just over 38 inches a year. And in the last, uh, this is like 45 to 2015. i got to update this so it's like an actual 100. But we've gone up almost 5 inches. So the 30-year average is, has increased 5 inches. That doesn't seem like a lot. But for farmers who are getting the rain when they don't want it, unless when they do, those crops are having, either we're washing all the fertilizer off or the seed off or the soil away or the water isn't coming when they do need it later in the growing season. And so this is a real problem for the mono crops that we're growing here. And that means that leads to increasing runoff. I don't think that's any surprise to anyone. You get more rain, you're going to have more runoff, which means the more chances for pollutants to be picked up off the land and carried out into, down the curb and gutter into the small streams and into our rivers. So that could be the oil that leaked out of your car. That could be the trash that came out of someone's, you know, window. Um, that could be the dog waste. It could be the extra fertilizer you put on your, because you wanted a green lawn. Or anything that's on that land that could get into the curb and gutter. And this is a, just to show you that when it rains a lot, this was 2011, 12, we get more loads of that nitrogen and phosphorus. So if it doesn't rain a lot, they're not washing off the farm fields. When we get these hot, you know, heavy storms, it is raining off. And so it's very weather dependent, so it's seasonal. So it's not, it's not a consistent rise. We do 24-7, 365 monitoring for nitrogen phosphorus in the rivers, among other things. But this is to show, this, is, this kind of information helps us justify requests from the federal government like the USDA for some of their innovative grants that we can then bring back to this region and, and pay those farmers to do um, you know, new practices that would stop this. We've actually brought in millions of dollars to do that. So the bad news is the climate models are all in, in um, agreement that it's going to get hotter and wetter. Now we've already talked about flood risk, but our system is ready to handle more. So we're, we think we're good there. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to need hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in these dams. They are 100 years old. And so it is going to take all of us to make sure that they are stable and ready and strong. We believe them to be in good shape, but they do need some work. Uh, and all these things. So warmer, you know, fish and bugs like it cold. So our, have, our ecosystems are going to start suffering as these temperatures get hot. Those small mouth. Uh, I would say the good news is we got a lot of groundwater. People should come live here. We've got plenty to go around. We want them to be responsible for it and use it wisely, but we got a lot in our bowl down there. Uh, however, what if everybody started irrigating at once? Our farmers don't really irrigate around here, but they're starting to experiment with that. What if they were all irrigating at the same time? Oh, we're going to draw down that aquifer think dramatically that we would suddenly run out but certainly some wells would need to get deeper. So generally when a well starts to um, have a shortage or not enough water, it's because the well itself is not deep enough. It's not because the aquifer is running dry, if that makes sense. Uh, and then this uh, keeps me up at night, among other things. Uh, this is the idea that somebody would build a pipeline to our aquifer and begin to suck water and send it to somewhere out west. Yeah. It doesn't seem, didn't seem very plausible, because water is heavy, it's expensive to move, until they built the Rocky Express pipeline, which runs through the, uh, not too far, it runs across the bottom of our basin out west to move ga uh, gas. <clears throat> and um, now, they have the, now they have the real estate. And when you hear the headlines about what's going on related to the Colorado, related to the Columbia, related to um, the Las Vegas and all that, there's, who knows? So there's no actual um, real great laws that help us protect to keep our aquifer water here. And we are thinking about how we set ourselves up uh, in the future for that. How do we design some rules? The Great Lakes can't be sent out basin without all the signatures of the governors around the Great Lakes. So we need something like that here. So there's lots of things that communities can do embracing this green infrastructure, make sure we're protecting our source water areas, um, you know, just increasing all the places 
to, that can infiltrate. You know, our rooftops are so solid. Our parking lots are solid. So the more we can create these green spaces that absorb water, fill our bowl back up, the better. Okay, now on to the fun stuff, real quick. Any questions about water stewardship? I, I kind of think it did. I think I ran must have run out of batteries. Yeah. Can you still so. hear me? Yeah, okay. I can get louder. I was just trying not to be loud because I knew it was right here. So I left back on the table uh, annual report for water stewardship, uh, water trail map for the Great Miami, and a brochure on how what you can do at home because um, we can all take actions that help protect water. So just to tell you, those are back there. But let me give you a little bit of information on river recreation, because that's the fun part. We have some of the world's best land and water trails. We were the first river system in Ohio to get a national water trail designation by the National Park Service and the Department of Interior. They only give those to very clean and accessible waterways. We also were some of the first to get National Recreation Trail. How many of you have been out on the Great Miami Bike Trail or one of the bike trails? So we are a National Recreation Trail. You know, those are just, they only give those to trails that are, you know, really accessible, have lots of miles, and of course ours has more than most. Um, you know, we connect to some of these, similar to the Appalachian Trail system, this North Country Trail, the Buckeye Trail, uh, we're, we're part of all of those things. So we're really proud of our trail system. And without the, the river system and without the Conservancy District's access, you know, access to those corridors, none of this would have been possible. We have a lot of river recreation, including river surfing, if you were not familiar. We have uh, a bunch of whitewater play areas, both on the Buck Creek and the Mad River and down now in downtown Dayton on the Great Miami, which has become this very sort of infamous um, river surfing activity. And we just recently filmed a documentary on surfing um, for Scripps uh, New Newsy, which is a channel, Newsy is a new, not a new channel, I think they rebranded from something else. Um, but they did a surfing documentary from all over the world and they came and did a little special on river surfing. So we're, we're, we're infamous now for the river surfing. But these beautiful parks that run along the rivers <clears throat> and uh, you know just many, many miles of, of accessible play areas. We do know that bacteria can still be a problem. So even though we don't have combined sewers for the most part, I should have said, Middleton has a few, uh, since, uh, Springfield has a few, they're all working towards getting rid of them, but most of our communities don't have them at all. However, <coughs> everything is old, it's aging, it's getting leaky, everything was built post-World War II, that's why there's a big push for infrastructure investment all around the country, because everything's kind of aging at the same time. So we do get these cross connections where bacteria might get into the regular system and then out into our rivers. So we do um, bacteria testing and then we have an app. There's an app for that. And so you can go on and see if bacteria is a problem in the river the day you want to go out. It's offline during the cold weather months because bacteria doesn't like cold water. Um, but we're trying to communicate to river users about safety. So this is one aspect. Bike trail safety, we do a lot of education. You know, there have been a lot of tragedies, there have been a few tragedies in the river related to unsafe um, either conditions or maybe they weren't wearing life jackets or they went out at the wrong time of the year. And so we do a lot of education around how to access this river safely. And we're going to be kicking off even a, a more advanced safety program this spring. We also recognize that. This river is our mountain, it's our ocean. We need to use it as our narrative to tell people about all the active, exciting, and fun things. And so uh, we formed a riverfront city coalition and we had a branding expert come in and we branded the river corridor as the Great Miami Riverway. So think of it as the Outer Banks or the, uh, the, um, the Shenandoahs or you know a place that you might go vacation 
this, the Riverway is a regional destination um, branding narrative. Uh, Mayor Church was instrumental in um, creating this and bringing all the river's front cities together. And so Miamisburg was really one of the founding um, entities of this partnership. It now includes 20 cities, counties, park districts um, as partners um, in this amazing narrative. And so it's just about telling our story. We had an expert come in and say, gosh, you have all the things already. The parks, the trails, the rivers, um, river access, amazing riverfront cities that are thriving and fun. And they said, but nobody knows because you've never told anyone about it. Mm -hmm. So that's how the brand became, um, was created. And that helps our cities enable economic investment. I should have swapped these out for something just down the street. But Hamilton has built, um, you know, downtown parks and Miamisburg has their amazing riverfront park and you know what Dayton has done and, and then resident residential follows that and all this investment so that wouldn't have happened if these cities weren't working together to to really change that narrative so the bottom line is we have all this plentiful water it's very clean we have hundreds of thousands of college students that's our workforce college students when they're asked about what are you going to do after college the first thing is get a job the second thing is move somewhere active exciting and fun so that's this narrative is not just about you know branding our region as something awesome but as branding our region so that we can have a healthy uh, productive workforce um, and economic development and i would say that is it any questions all right, yours was first. What kind of legal entity is the district? Mm. I left that out. <clears throat> like where does your funding come from and who? We are a regional government, local. So we are out of Ohio Revised Code 6101. Uh, we, our boundaries are the watershed itself. And uh, we have um, assessment authority. So anyone who is protected from flooding pays an assessment based on the value of the property that's being protected. So if your home is based on um, uh, the height of the flood, at the, t the height of the 1913 flood, and then your current home value. So it'd be on your property taxes. So that's flooding. So people who are protected pay. Now we do try to leverage as many state and federal grants for additional items, but that's the basis of all of the funding for flooding. We have three separate silos for um, flooding so that river recreation money doesn't pay for flood protection and vice versa. The cities who have asked us to build bike trails and boat ramps and other things for recreation pay an assessment based on the value of the thing that we're managing. Um, and then the water stewardship programs is actually a watershed wide assessment. So nine counties pay into that and that's more widely distributed. So if you're paying, if you live in this region and go look at your property taxes, it's going to say aquifer preservation subdistrict and it might be a dollar. So we distributed that far and wide, but then we can collect enough money to run a good program. But again, state and federal grants, local grants, foundations, anywhere that we can get extra money, we're adding it to that pot. So, uh, we are, we have a staff, our headquarters are in Dayton, but we have staff up and down the, the river corridor to manage our, all of the, the properties. Um, and those lands behind each dam that I talked about that need to be protected for, for flood protection. Um, we have staff, you know, up and down the corridor, but we are, uh, have a general manager who's appointed by a board of directors, three board of directors, um, and each of those board of directors are appointed by something called the Conservancy Court. Back in the day, you know, when the politicians were corrupt and couldn't be trusted, <laughs> our founding yeah. fathers thought that it was important that we stay away from that corruption of the day, and so each county that has the, that we work in. Uh, has a common pleas court judge assigned to the conservancy court. So the court oversees the board of directors and then the staff. So it's a specific Ohio law that gives the MCD all of its 
I, I left that out. There's, you know, there's so much to the story. And I, so the Conservancy Court, so the Conservancy Law was passed in 1914. And the governor of the time was Cox. And of course, he was from Hamilton. He watched his own city become completely devastated by the Great Flood. And so he helped usher in that Conservancy Law so that then these regional governments could be created to deal with water you know, on, a, on a, a regional basis. I'm glad you asked that question. Let me, let me add a personal one. Our house is on the west bank of the Miami River in Franklin. Mm -hmm. We are protected by the levy. I see my property taxes. And it says, I'm a conservancy, and they have reevaluated our property values and went up. So I'm going to be donating, uh, contributing a little more to your funding because of that. So as your property values rise, then our, you know, our assessment will rise slightly. We have been able to keep it very steady otherwise, but um, we're going to need to reevaluate because the needs are so great. So the, the thing is, it's widely distributed. Um, I don't feel like I'm paying for the whole thing. You don't but I do feel like my, my fair share of more. The guys that live on high ground that were never flooded, they don't have the same thing. And our was four to five feet above groundwater through our house in 1913. Yeah, and so you can, so you're paying to make sure that doesn't happen again. Okay, that's good. Yeah. The uh, company that bought out the old DPNL Hutchinson plant. <gasps> yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah. What um, do you want to know? Curious about, you know, they keep saying we're going to take the dam out. We're going to take the dam out. When and do they have to ask you guys anything or tell you anything about it? What effect will it have? So forth. Good, uh, good question. So, uh, Frontier Group bought Hutching Station, and that came with the dam. It wasn't a choice, yeah. and it was a requirement of the sale that they remove the dam. So it's coming out no matter what. Okay. It is uh, an old dam built specifically for the power plant. It is also a very dangerous dam. If you went over it, you, you could uh, be trapped in the downstream boil yeah. and you could die. And in fact, uh, there's been a tragic story in the history of um, a fire uh, man at that dam. So it's coming out no matter what. However, and it is not on our land, and we don't have to give or cannot give permissions or anything. Okay. We're just supportive, okay. um, and we're very supportive of the the remodel there because it's going to be turned into um, mixed use residential. There, there's a whole bunch of things I can't talk about, but there may or may not be a brewery there. There may or may not be all sorts of other fun things happening, and hopefully in the next year they'll be making a bunch of announcements. However. To work in the river, you have to have an Army Corps permit. You have to have a permit with the Ohio EPA. You have to have a mitigate. You have to have a lot of plans in place, and so it's tough. It's there's a lot of hoops to jump through, and they're jumping through the hoops now. Okay. So they hired a great, um, a very experienced consulting firm that has done dam removal before, who's taking them through the process, and it just takes time. Sure. So we had that same company help us with a dam removal just recently on uh, in front of UD. It was called the Tate Station Dam. Oh, yeah. Same thing. It was a dp &L power plant there. In the 80s, they gave us the dam. We, we thought it was a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, here, take this old dam. We're like, great, we'll manage it for recreation. Well, that's fun for a while, but then 40 years later, the dam needs $8 million in repairs because mm -hmm. it's falling apart. And it only cost 1.7 to remove, so ee, ee, the dam came out. Right. Uh, and we were actually able to get someone else to pay for it, so happy, happy, happy. And then the river's restored, and then there's no safety issues there. And so the long story short is it's coming out. We just have to be patient. Um, it's not related to flood protection. Those little dams, they, they're called run-of-the-river dams. Mm -hmm. That's another nickname for them. They have no impact on flood protection whatsoever. Right. And um, it will, however potentially uh, uh, cause those rowers to uh, find a new home. So. That's the same type of dam that was in Chautauqua. They built the Chautauqua yeah, dam Chautauqua to failed. To, yeah, to run the water down for the uh, paper mills. Yeah. And so they, that was all there. And they still... Englewood had one too and they took it out. They took two out of Englewood, but you know what? There's still 60 low dams in this region. <laughs> and some of them won't because they're being used for something, right? He's first, oh, and then you. 
my, I have several questions. How, I thought most of the low dams, that's what they call them, low dams, had been removed off of the Great Miami. Uh, many of them have. There are two in Hamilton, um, Sydney, Piqua, Troy. Those are all scheduled or planned to come out. Um, West Carrollton? West Carrollton. They are working up a plan to alter it for surfing. Hmm. So they're raising money right now to alter that one for surfing. surfing. In West Carrollton, that's going to be fun. Uh huh. Is the Chautauqua Dam still exist? No, no, only no. Pieces, pieces of it. That's it, why I thought it, it pretty much washed out. It yeah. washed out, but when the river's low, you can see yeah, some of, of the chunks it. there. Middletown, mm -hmm. another dam failed there, too. I'm on the Little Miami Basin, and currently, as we speak, there is an effort to remove the, the only remaining low dam on the Little Miami. In, in uh, Corwin. Above Corwin. Corwin. Little Miami River. Now, there's also one, that's a bit kind of, there's also one in, um, um, what's that little town that used to have uh, the Der Dutchman in it? That's, that's, Wayne, uh, that's it. That's yeah, Waynesville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh, that's it. Waynesville. I mean, that's it. Yeah. Waynesville. Yeah. Yeah. The Dutchman was located on the raceway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so yeah. last I heard, they didn't want that dam to come out, but maybe there's more. Well, okay. <laughs> this is current. Yeah. This is very current. Yeah. In 06, there was an effort to take it out. If you want to look up the Dayton Daily News, I'm quoted in there. Okay, <laughs> I the effort to kill it. And uh, anyhow, it's no sex, and now it's come back around. A guy by the name of Coogan, I think, but it's some kind of regional beyond this area. Yeah. Flood management, whatever. And that's the only remaining low dam on the on little. On the entire mile. little. Hmm. Now, I have a question. Do you know? whether the water quality changes above the low dams. I mean, it, have you any statistics that say, okay, the water quality above the low dam is worse than below yes. the low dam? Yes. In fact, we, yes, I can say with assuredness that the, the, the habitat for fish and bugs is not as good upstream of a dam as it is downstream because the water gets slowed, the oxygen is lower, that's where sometimes nutrients pool. And we, when we removed our low dams in downtown Dayton, um, we did, and Englewood, we did studies upstream and downstream before the dam was removed and after. And we, shot, we saw very good results that the water quality improved. Well, just last night I reported to our local council something that I thought was relevant. They make a big deal about the mollusk being affected by, it. okay, my dad was a farmer, and we far, farmed river bottoms right adjacent to the low dam. He farmed it from 38 to, to 58. As a small child, I was in the fields. There was a lot of mollusk shells. And that was 100 years after the dam was built. Well, but by 1950, they were all gone. Now, the dam, the, over, the low dam didn't affect that. There was other factors yeah. that affected that. That was my point. It wasn't the low dam. Yeah, there are other factors. Yes, you are right. And the smaller the dam, and that one's pretty small, the smaller the dam, the less of an impact it has. So the bigger the dam, the longer upstream the impact would be, and the smaller the dam, the smaller the impact would be. You know, sometimes it's just in the immediate area. Yeah. So I don't disagree with you about that. How do you qualify the, 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 the height of the dam? In other words, is there a certain standard you're talking about? Well, the, the low dams don't have those kind of same standards. Um, that The low dams don't have the same kind of yeah. standards or they don't have a, they don't have categorizations like the large dams are, there are is it high hazard, low, something, categories. The low dams don't have categories. To, to my, to my, my own personal opinion, the forces behind removing that dam are the canoe industry that don't want to have to portage. Well, that's, you might not be wrong, because... I don't think yeah, I'm a bit wrong. Yeah, if you take that dam out, it's going to drop the water level and you have to... Well, the, prob the other problem is there's well, a, almost a two-mile... if you take it out, you don't have to portage at all. There's almost a two-mile raceway. This is all, about the largest channel. raceway that I know of. And if they'd knock that dam out, now you're going to have a bug flat two and a half miles long of cattails and mosquito breeding. <laughs>
Well, I will tell you that when we removed the dam at downtown Dayton, um, people were worried about that very thing. And every river is different, but I can tell you that in downtown Dayton, we, we the river found its natural path again, and there were no there were no um, the one thing that someone said was stinking mudflats. <clears throat> we didn't end up with any of that. The river found a natural channel and, and you know, revegetated. We would definitely so. have that problem. We would definitely it's a temporary have problem. problem. If it finds it, presumably it will grow and cover, so it would be yeah. temporary. Yeah. For us, it was temporary. Yeah. You had a question, then you have one. No, you answered it. Okay. Carol. Oh, I have two little questions. So, first, uh, I'm originally from Miamisburg, but I've lived most of my life in other places like Minneapolis and Seattle. Yeah, this, and I just moved this back thing here was dormant for 17 summer. years and just came back When I up. lived in Minneapolis, I noticed that the river there, uh, Mississippi River, is I'm very sure beautiful. It's a canoe and it's coming, trees lying yeah. all along it. And when I came back here and I moved to downtown Dayton, the river looks like a drainage ditch. There's no trees. It's just all barren and open. And in the summer, it's like breaking, you know, 100 degrees. And I think about there's no shelter for the wildlife. It's just all open. And so, so is there a reason why there are no trees? So the levee system, which includes about 50 miles on either side, parts of Pickwell all the way down through northern Hamilton County, um, the levee systems have to comply with federal standards for levee safety and levee integrity. And so in those some areas, we do maintain them for a, a special kind of turf. Um, and so we can reduce drift. They can be cleaned easily. We can inspect them easily. We can make sure there's no animal holes in them. Um, trees falling over would rip holes in the levees if they had a root system. And so there are standards for levee integrity. However, in between those areas are highly vegetated forested riverbanks in between these each of these cities that we protect so we have a balance of both but we do have to we do have to manage them according to um, you know the best practices that flood protection experts recommend and so we have to balance that okay i was wondering if there was a reason for that uh, my second question is i i do like to take the bike trail and i go along all over the place i do i notice there's a lot of garbage a lot of trash that accumulates next to the river and in the bushes and trees next to the river. Um, I'm interested personally as like to go and volunteer and pick up yep. this trash. Can so that's a that really good question. Do? So there is a river corridor wide effort. So our communities are really good at partnering and we have a 157 mile long river cleanup every year. It happens on a series of weekends. It's not all the aspirationally it was supposed to be the same day but that's a little impossible so it's several weekends in the July and several weekends in October and you can um, volunteer for a section and they give you t-shirts and grabbers and gloves and free lunch and all of that stuff and uh, you go to clean sweep of the great Miami River dot com and you can sign up for a section either in Miamisburg or somewhere else if you want to see somewhere else and uh, we'd love to have more people pick up trash yep the staff our staff uh, adopts one of those and the, the whole river is partitioned into sections and so our staff adopt one of those sections go out every year and anecdotally we find fewer tires than we did decades ago mm -hmm. um, so we we hope it's getting better but you know trash comes out of the storm drains you know all sorts of places and so the more we can keep those storm drains clear curbs and gutters clear then the more that river will stay clean but yeah all hands on deck at this point I just go like by myself down to the river in Miamisburg and take the trash bag and pick up the trash and then just because the every day is river cleanup day is what I say yeah <laughs> related to that I mean, the people that use the bike path are pretty clean I don't see so much along there as I see on the public streets that are near yeah, I, I, I can't say for sure. I, I mean, cyclists in general don't seem like big litter bugs, but um, I would say that I think most of the trash that we're seeing in the plastic bottles and all of that, it's from storm storm runoff, rain, the wind, or, rain runoff. The winds around here. Winds and, yeah. Blow it all around. You can't blow a glass bottle, but you right. certainly can't one of these plastic ones. Yeah, well, in glass, you know, you can get paid for that or recycle yeah. it. And, and the plastic, the one-time plastic bottle use is a huge problem. Wish we could solve that. 
Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. We greatly appreciate you showing up and explaining it. Well, thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Remember, we're going to have uh, a seminar next month on the 22nd.